Thank you once again and good evening. I invite you to please stand for the national anthem of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. Please remain standing. I'll invite Dr. Terence Farrell to lead the interreligious prayer. Almighty God, giver of all good things, look with favor upon us, all of us here gathered here this evening. Show us with your blessings of peace, love, and fellowship as we engage in this consultation with the people of Port of Spain and environment for the betterment of the lives of the people of Trinidad and Tobago through constitutional reform. And at the end of these proceedings, take each of us safely back to our homes and our families. Amen. Namaste. Thank you. I invite you to sit. The Chair and members of the National Advisory Committee on Constitutional Reform, citizens of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, residents of the City of Port of Spain and Environs, members of the media, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Good evening once again. Welcome to uh, City Hall. This evening we are in the Murchison Brown Auditorium and our engagement focuses on constitutional reform and your input, an opportunity for members of the public to participate actively in the discussions with the National Advisory Committee on Constitutional Reform. As a safety advisory, the uh, organizers here at City Hall have advised that there are no emergency uh, drills or activities of that nature scheduled for this evening. In the event of an alarm or an announcement for evacuation, we are to use the entrance that we would have used at the start to make our way into this auditorium and proceed to the muster point at Woodford Square. There are officers of the municipal police and the city police here who will, of course, assist us at uh, Woodford Square at the muster point. And then from there, you will receive your instructions um, subsequently. Thank you for your cooperation in the event of an emergency. I'm your moderator. Uh, lovely to be with you. My name is Wendell Constantine. And to deliver opening remarks this evening, we'll get underway. Would you please welcome the chairman of the National Advisory Committee on Constitutional Reform, Mr. Barindra Sinanan, SC. Thank you, Mr. Moderator Wendell Constantine. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Let me welcome you to the third town hall meeting we are having on the Constitutional Reform Committee. We've had two other meetings before, one in Sangre Grande and one in Point Forte. And um, the, the first thing that comes to my mind is that both in Sangre Grande and Point Forte, at this point in time, we had a, a bigger audience. So this has struck me that um, the sparsity of the audience. Nevertheless, 
I know we have quality in, in, in the audience that is present uh, this evening. And sometimes quality is more important than quantity. So we have been uh, asked by the Prime Minister to develop terms of reference for a national consultation on, on the Constitution. I think everybody recognizes that the Constitution needs reform in some, some form or fashion. The last time a meaningful exercise, well, one that resulted in some form of uh, reform to the Constitution was the Wooden Commission, which sat in around 1974, led us into the Republican Constitution. Um, a lot of the recommendations in the Wooden Commission didn't see the light of day. Uh, at that time. We are hoping as a committee to look at all those previous four incarnations of constitutional reform uh, exercises and with the help of the general public to come up with terms of reference for this national consultation. Everybody talks about national, about, sorry, about constitutional reform. And yes, the Constitution needs reform. It's, it's 50 years now that we have the, operating the same Constitution. Lots of things that can be corrected in the Constitution. We are not here as a committee to tell the government what we need, what the committee sees. What we are here to do is to collate what you, the people, want to see change in the Constitution. We would have our own views as a committee, and that may be a separate exercise for us to uh, uh, do and address the Prime Minister on. But our main objective is to listen to what the people have to say and put that in uh, some form that represents a term of reference, terms of reference for the national consultation. That takes place, as announced by the Prime Minister, in June of this year. Um, so, without much further ado, I would uh, pass you on to Dr. Farrell, who would, in greater detail, indicate to you what we expect from the, the general population and the, the, what we hope to achieve uh, in order to fulfill our, our, our mandate. Dr. Farrell. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, so, this exercise that we embarked on, um, I, I, I keep saying, is, is, the, is the fifth time that the country, since the 1976 Constitution, has been embarked on some process for constitutional reform. Um, the, the, as, as the chairman mentioned, the, the Wooding Commission, which ran from, from essentially from 1972 to 1974, um, it was a very difficult period at the time. As you know, there was the previous Black Power uh, um, Revolution. There was states of emergency at that time. So the Wooding and they had a, had a, had a fairly difficult task. Uh, they made some significant recommendations. Uh, so those of you who are not familiar with the Wooding Constitution uh, Commission report, I invite you to read it. It's on the website for this, uh, for this committee. You can see it there. <clears throat> Excellent recommendations. Uh, however, uh, the Prime Minister at the time, Eric Williams, decided not to proceed <laughs> with many of the recommendations of the Wooding Commission, and essentially what we have now operating in Trinidad and Tobago is the 1976 Republican Constitution, which reflected what Williams wanted to see <clears throat> at the time. But it was very clear that the, 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 the population uh, was, was not happy with that result, and in very short order, within um, 10 years, the NAR regime uh, had initiated a process for constitutional reform, the Hayatali Commission, which began work in 87, 88. The work of the Hayatali Commission, which again is also on our website, uh, you can look at it, uh, they started essentially the same process of public consultations and so on. Uh, but that work was interrupted by the 1990 attempted coup and essentially stopped. The, the first Manning administration, 91-95, didn't do anything in respect of constitutional reform. Uh, neither did the Pandey administration between 95 and 2001, except that the Pandey administration in, in those years initiated 
some significant pieces of legislation which had constitutional implications, specifically the Freedom of Information Act, the Integrity in Public Life Act, and the Judicial Review Act, all of which have important, uh, as I say, implications for the Constitution and how our Constitution actually worked and operated. Uh, then we had a bunch of businessmen, a group of businessmen, the Principles of Fairness Committee, and this is really very unusual because I don't know of any other jurisdiction where the, 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 a process for constitutional reform was initiated not by the government or by the parliament, but by a, a, a group of business people. And I think that that is significant because it tells you that the, 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 the perceived need for constitutional reform was clearly out there. Uh, and that group of, of, of businessmen called the Principles of Fairness Committee actually drafted a, a, a constitution. Uh, it was drafted um, largely by, by Taj Mahal Hussain. Um, and again, you'll see that on our website um, in, in terms of, of, of what it what outlines and expresses. The Manning administration, which was in power at the time, have taken note of the Principles of Fairness Committee, decided that it too wanted to uh, initiate constitutional reform, and there was a talk about the executive presidency, and uh, Manning had Ellis Clark do uh, several drafts of a revised constitution for Trinidad and Tobago, culminating in the draft around 2009, uh, and you'll see that the working document for that is on our website. Uh, essentially, they also engaged in a process of, of consultation going around the country. That was interrupted by the early election in 2010. And then the UNC People's Partnership Administration too also initiated a process of constitutional reform with the Ramadan Committee, which began work in 2013, out of which came uh, certain amendments to the Constitution, which were tabled in Parliament in 2015. I say all of that to say that uh, we have had these attempts at constitutional reform over the course of the last 50 years. And we can take the view, as many people do, or perhaps the skeptical view, the cynical view, that it's, this one is another exercise that is going to go nowhere and is going to be a waste of time. The view that I prefer to take is that these efforts coming over the course of the last 50 years indicate that the society sees a need for constitutional reform. All the administrations, NAR, PNM, UNC, have initiated constitutional reform initiatives, as has this new, this, this new PNM administration. Uh, so with that, I think it's about an understanding that the society needs or is perceiving a need for change. And it's about how we go about that process. I should also point out that uh, in other Caribbean countries, in Barbados, in Jamaica, uh, there have been similar attempts at constitutional reform over the course of the last many years. Um, Jamaica has, uh, Barbados has made some significant advances. They have, now, they have now become a republic, but they too are even now engaged in a process of constitutional uh, re reform. Uh, Jamaica, as you all know, is in the middle of a process of constitutional reform. They, ha they have not become a republic. They are now looking at becoming a republic. There's a debate there about several aspects of how they do that, including the adoption of the CCJ in Jamaica. Guyana made some significant uh, steps in respect of reforming their constitution. They have a new constitution as of the early parts of this, of this century, which has been working reasonably well for Guyana. So what we are doing here in Trinidad is certainly not out of step. Uh, the problem has been taking the reforms to conclusion and actually making change happen uh, in our constitution. The, 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 the other thing that we want to point out is that there are impetuses for change in the constitution which we can see very evidently outside. Since 1976, we as a country have signed on to some important international treaties and conventions. The International Conventions on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, the Conventions on, the, on, on, on Women, the Conventions on the Rights of the Child, all of these have come after the 1976 Constitution, and those important changes are not reflected in the Constitution which we now operate. 
we have seen important changes in our society, as we see it. Some things have been good, some things that we know have been not so good. The increase in crime and so on and so forth have not been not so good. We are asking questions about how have our values as a society changed? Because the Constitution has to reflect our values as a people. So our part of the process as, as a committee is to interrogate all of that. And we are doing that, we, we think we have some significant advantages compared to the Wooding Commission. Uh, Wooding did not have the advantage of, of, of internet and email and social media or even traditional media. When, when, when Wooding's commission was working, there was one television station in Trinidad and Tobago. There were two radio stations. So we have considerable advantages. We have the advantage of all of those previous reports that were done, many of the recommendations are still important, they're still valid today. We have, we think, to take into consideration some of those international conventions and so on that we have signed on to. We have to take into account new thinking that is there in respect of fundamental rights, fundamental freedoms, and we also know that many of the institutions of our society are not working well. One of the things that we've been saying to people as we go around the country, and of course our job here this evening is to listen, not to talk, but we've been saying to people that the problems that you're experiencing in your local communities, in your daily lives, whether it be the condition of your roads, the water, the electricity, all of those things, those issues and those problems can in fact be traced back to the institutions of the Constitution. So the local problems that you're experiencing do have a constitutional root, and we therefore need to think about how we address fixing those institutions in the, in the Constitution so that people in Trinidad and Tobago can have a better life. So I hope that gives you a background to the exercise that we are about. Uh, we, we, are, we, are, we have a very fast track to complete this by end of May, June, but we think that it is doable largely because we, have, we are making use of modern technology uh, in, including emails. We have, to date, received over 180 submissions via email. Wooding, in its entire um, um, period of, of, of two years, received 100 submissions, their, their report. We already have 180 email submissions. We have asked all of the Constitution office holders in Trinidad and Tobago, that is every office holder who is named in the Constitution, we have asked them to send in their views and their recommendations. We have asked all the senior council in Trinidad and Tobago, that is the senior council, the people, members of the inner bar, to send in their recommendations. We are engaged in discussions with experts, academic experts, constitutional lawyers. We will be talking to people who are sociologists and psychologists and so on to probe questions around our values. And we are doing all of that, and we intend to put all of that together hopefully by the end, well not hopefully, definitely by the end of May, early June, to pass on to the cabinet for its actions, including laying out a roadmap as to how we move forward. So with that, I want to thank you very much for, for, um, for listening, and we look forward to hearing what you have to say to us this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Terence Farrell. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as we prepare for your turn, and your engagement, permit me just for the purposes of uh, formality to share with you, of course, the members of the committee. Of course, the committee chair who spoke and welcomed you is a former speaker of the House of uh, Representatives, uh, uh, Barindra Sinan SC. We've just heard from attorney at law and former Central Bank Deputy Governor, Dr. Terence Farrell. Also on the committee are uh, Mr. Nizam Mohammed, attorney at law and former speaker of the House. Mrs. Helen Drayton, former independent senator. Uh, Ms. Hema Narainsingh, who is with us this evening, consulting manager partner at EY. Mr. Winston Rudder, with us, public service commission chair and former permanent secretary in the Ministry of Agriculture. Uh, Ms. Jacqueline Sampson Miguel, attorney at law and former clerk of the House and uh, Ray Sandy, former Tobago House of Assembly chief administrator. So for those that are with you this uh, evening, if at any time there is context that perhaps you need to draw or, or recollection, they're also here to assist you with um, memory gaps associated with their role, but also they are contributors as part of the National Advisory Committee on Constitutional Reform. So here we go. 
we're now ahead of schedule, which is a good thing for you. I've been guided that during this dialogue session, opportunity for, uh, for the committee to hear from you, uh, we kindly ask that as you make your way to either of the microphones in the room, one at a time, please, that you present your name and just simply indicate where you're from, and that could be district. Um, if you want to say former Port of Spain girl or boy, that's also acceptable. Um, and of course, uh, from there, from sharing your general location, they have guided that they are suggesting that your time limit per contribution is five minutes. I do have a certain amount of discretion, and so I shall uh, waive to a certain extent the length of time of engagement, uh, but please, if you see me make my way to uh, the microphone, it is really that we would now want to move on to the next contributor. So let's use seven minutes at this time as the gauge that we'll work with. It is already above the quota that was assigned per, uh, per participant. So the microphones are now open. The floor is yours, and we invite you to make your contributions. Good evening. A very good evening to all. Robert Amar, Digo Martin. The first two things I want to suggest is information going out. We talk about emails. I am not aware of emails beginning with www. And if it does, it's strange to me. But in this paper that we got, it said constitutionalreform2024.gov.tt. And when you try that, it doesn't work. So we need to fix the communication. <clears throat> There's a famous guy, he's a German philosopher. His name is Friedrich Nietzsche. He says, sometimes people don't want to hear the truth because they don't want their illusions destroyed. 40 years after the fact, we are still failing to accept the truth. What's the truth? To change the constitution of Trinidad and Tobago requires a majority that neither political party has. And based on this audience, it is clear the people are not concerned. Because if they were, they would be here in numbers to share their views. But they have lost confidence in the system. I am happy that the prime minister took the initiative to call this committee together. And I would like to share in Mr. Farrell's, um, Dr. Farrell's sentiment of let's hope that it will do better. But I have to remind you of Friedrich Nietzsche's views. The reality is that only time will tell whether this is a political move to quell the society based on a comment, which I will quote, that came from the Prime Minister in 2023. This is what he said. <clears throat> some citizens have been complaining for some time that they feel far removed from the government and overall they hold a sense of being remote and excluded. This has been a perennial grievance. The opportunity to seriously address it is with us now. So let us grasp it enthusiastically and make it work towards building that better nation we often talk about. Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley. That's his words, not mine. But then there's another guy called Aldous Hexley. I hope I pronounced his name right. The deepest sin against the human mind is to believe things without evidence. And the bottom line is you can't manage without the measurement. We have five different people that came. They brought it together. If the cabinet, if the parliament cannot make the decision, then all of this is just time and effort to again write another report without resolve. We know the problems. In 1987, we had a committee. That committee had some real people, boy. Isaac Hayatali, the late. Alan McKenzie. Michael de Labastide, the late. Selwyn Ryan, the late, John Laguerre, Hamid Ghani, Justice Gaya Passad, 
and of course, Miss Monica Barnes. All those people went forward and gave their time like you. And what has happened? I hear that you're going to use the information that was there before because in the days of the old, <laughs> they didn't have what you have. How important are the views of the citizens? You see, because when we talk about changing the constitution, it's not about the 41 people that has voted into the parliament. It's about the sovereign republic of Trinidad and Tobago's citizens. And therefore, if you want to make the change, your first point of call is to institutionalize something called a referendum and ask the people in the country what they want. Because if you do not get the will of the people to push the 41, the 41 will continue to push the people as we have seen for 40 years. You come with all these great ideas, and at the end, they just take it and put it on the shelf. And they find an excuse, which is called in Palance, in Trinidad and Tobago, the political blame game. Can this conference scheduled for 24, June 24, cause the changes that the 76 and all the others wanted to do, including the great wooden? It's up to the will of the man that runs the country. Is he going to be flexible to put in into the Constitution instead of pass the post, proportional representation, as has happened in Guyana? And we saw what happened in that elections, and we knew what happened at the end. Suppose the population tells you they want referendum. Will you put that into your document? and tell the politicians that that is what we must do? Or will that become just a foot rug? Freedom of the press is an important thing. And I tell you this today in all earnest. I am a banned person from going to the diplomatic center to talk to the prime minister about issues of this country. He has given an instruction I mustn't be there. Is that fair? In this constitution, where under the mandate, freedom of the press must be recognized according to your paper? How do we respect this today? But the man in charge disrespect this by saying only mainstream media is allowed because he has that right. Is that what he signed on for? Is that what he sweared on the Bible? And then the other thing, is that we have this institution, which is the parliament. And I think it's section 57 and 58. That clearly outlines that no matter what you or I do, we have no power. Because we don't have enough people in there to make the change. There's so much more I want to say, but I don't want to outlive my time. But let me just end by saying the following. If we're serious, we cannot eat the elephant whole. We must take this elephant and cut him up. And we must give the country some hope that at least the politicians are serious. So let's start with fixed date election. It's time for leaders to not come on a platform and say, I have it in my back pocket. The Americans don't do that. Their date is fixed. We need to put a fixed date for elections so we, the citizens, know exactly when elections will be called. We can't be hoping that when the Prime Minister returns, he busts a mark and he says, well, elections is going to be so-and-so. Let's find out whether referendum is something we can use to help us move this constitutional reform in a positive way. Let's talk about a policy for the aged we have over 300,000 senior citizens in this country that really don't know whether they're getting up or sleeping. Let's have something in the Constitution dealing with food and water, the two most important things for humanity. Because if you don't have food and you don't have water, you're not going to survive, and water is a problem. And let's look at savings expenditure and holding people accountable. 
not just responsible. Because in our society, as we have seen, four divers gone, two years after the fact, and still no conclusion. And we have a senator, independent, launched an issue recently in the parliament, asking them to rethink how that will work. The same senator called on the independent institutions, asking them to make sure they hold the government accountable through those independent institutions that seem not to be independent. How are we going to move the process forward? It has to be people driven, and the people have to be motivated. But it also has to be bite size. Because right now, we are still trying to eat the whole elephant, fully aware that we cannot. Let me end with Friedrich Nietzsche as I close. Sometimes, people don't want to hear the truth because they don't want their illusions destroyed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Amar, for your contribution. Uh, permit me also to say that in response to your first observation, the Secretariat immediately set about verifying uh, the concern that you raised. So here's what we're going to do, because I've been told that everything is working. Uh, camera, QR code on flyer, scanned. It brings up the site, constitutionalreform2024.gov.tt, which you're allowed to enter. And once you enter, recommendations is one of the tabs. So perhaps what should be clear is that there are various tabs as you are taken to the website where you could submit a recommendation. Something else, another document. Oh, sorry, I didn't send out. See what right here? That's different. Try to put it into the system. Yeah, that's right. So, yes, yes. So, and further, the NACCR's email address is naccr.secretariat at gov.tt. One more time, N-A-C-C-R dot secretariat at gov dot tt. I'm not at liberty to, to verify from the standpoint of wouldn't be in a document that, because I'm not part of the secretariat, but surely you can share it with them so that in the event that there are copies circulating, they can do the necessary update and correction. Uh, just to satisfy that the digital platform and the website are up and running and you may submit, all members of the public can submit their recommendations in the tab listed as recommendations. And thank you, Mr. Amar, for your observation and your feedback and guidance, notwithstanding uh, uh, what had been issued at the time. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the floor is open yet again. And so we invite our next contributor. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, committee members, uh, my name is Stephen Cadiz from the Maraval District. Um, I'm going to open with a, a statement that was made in the Constitutional Committee, the Wooding Commission, um, and it's under the heading, The Decline of Parliament. The executive had grown too strong and Parliament too ineffective so the first essential was to find ways and means of redressing the balance. And I think 50 years ago that was written, and I think it is so true now of what the Wooding Commission um, stated. The executive had grown too strong and the parliament too ineffective. So we must find a way for that to be corrected. And one of the things um, that, I, I, that I know um, doing research is that in the British Commonwealth, whether you are still in the Commonwealth or you're a, a former member of the Commonwealth, one of the things that the British did not like was power to the people. Okay? They wanted to have absolute control. And that is how the Commonwealth, 
That is how the colonies were operated. Absolute control came from the governor general, came from the attorney general, came from the, the controller of um, customs that collected the money to send back to the home country, okay? And that is how they ran their colonies. They ran it like a company. Uh, anyway, that was a, a, a long, long time ago. But here it is that we are still suffering the effects of British colonialism. And it is something, and I, I made a statement the other day um, on my blog about our coat of arms that still has Columbus's three ships on the coat of arms. And that's, that's, that just tells you how, imbre how in, uh, you know, it is, within, it, it, it is so embed embedded in us that we cannot even think out of the box when we, when we talk about that. One of the other things um, Mr. Amar mentioned just now, and I know he's an advocate for it, is the issue of referendum. And referendum is probably one of the most dangerous um, systems of democracy you could ever want, okay? And hence the reason the executive had grown too strong and the parliament too ineffective. And one of the means of dealing with that is the process of referendum. Process of referendum can mean a whole host of things. You can have a referendum. Look at what happened with Brexit. The British made a major mistake by having a simple majority to determine the future of their economy. So a, a referendum does not have to be binding, number one, but it feels the pulse of the people. It doesn't have to be a simple majority. You can have a referendum with a series of different um, conditions as to how this referendum is going to be um, conducted and, 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 and what are you going to allow the people to really and truly um, vote on. I did a referendum in 2006. I had a little committee called YesTT and we did a referendum where we actually mailed out close to one million copies um, to, to the electoral um, uh, through the electoral system. I got, this, the, I got the list from the EBC. Okay, it wasn't a blow um response. We got 54,000 respondents. Now, when you take 54,000 respondents and you look at what the average voting um, turnout is in an election, it was not a bad deal. And that was us. No budget, nothing. Okay? I, we also held a, a conference at the Hilton for two days where we had people who used um, referendum, proportional representation, uh, right to recall, had it in their constitutions, which was Suriname and Guyana and Ireland and um, out of the United States, out of the UK. We had professionals come and speak at the, at the Hilton. And it was, a very, it was a successful conference that, that we had. Here it is in Trinidad, when we look at the issue of the executive had grown too strong. The executive, and I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to politicize anything here, but I look at the most recent mm, instance that was made public, which is the appointment of a commission of police. And the process, and how that process was followed, how that process was stymied, and that is where the executive had grown too strong. So it is right front and center as to how our country is being, being run. It is front and center the little say that we, the people, have in, a, in running of the country. I was a parliamentarian, and I could tell you the directive from the prime minister is the directive. If you don't like it, the door. It's very, very simple. Go. All right? And that cannot be, because you cannot have a, an electorate of close to a million people, or just over a million people now, where one person, or two people, sorry, the prime minister on one side, and the leader of the opposition on the other side, is dictating to one million people what they should, how they should think, and how they should behave, and what they should want, and what they should not want. That cannot be right. In 2000 and in 2007, I believe, there was a party that got upwards of 24% of the vote. 24% of the vote, of the total vote, a third party got, was received. Not a single voice in the parliament. That cannot be right. 
You cannot expect people, and when we look at the turnout here today, and some of the other meetings that you have had, people are not interested. When they hear the Constitution, they fall asleep. Okay? And I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't mean anything, I'm not saying anything about the committee. What I'm saying is that unless you involve people meaningfully in a system, especially a system of governance, if you do not involve them, they are not going to come to these meetings. They are not going to say anything. The political leader says X, that is what they follow, and they go home after that. They have no interest in anything else. That cannot be right. A couple other things. The average percentage of a party winning an election in Trinidad, and this is not who voted, huh? this is, the, list, the, this is the, um, the number of voters that are on the EBC list, because that is an important thing. People say, look, we win the election. Yes, you won the election, but with what percentage of the vote did you win the election? What percentage of the registered voters actually voted for you? The average, num the average percentage in two-party, like, sorry, the average percentage of a winning party in Trinidad of, after 15 elections is 38.52%. So here it is, we have had minority governments successively. 1961, the voter turnout was 88%. The winning party, 50.19. That is in 1961, the year before independence. And that was a huge turnout that they had because I would assume that the electorate was all fired up that we're going to become an independent nation and therefore we're going to go and vote, okay? And if you look, if you look at the EBC figures after that, after 1961, it is a sad, sad situation. Our last election, 2020, most recent, with all the, all the, the communication that we have now, and here it is that we have a winning, a winning um, the party in power, with a 28.4%. 28.4%. And that is how we are forming our governments. We are forming our governments with a minority. This is, not a, this is not a majority. It's a minority. And again, going back to 2007, with the three parties, 24%. Imagine in, 2000, in 2020, the party won, the winning party won, with 28%. 28%. And in 2007, we have one party that got 24% and did not get a single seat. That cannot be right. And if we want people to engage in, in the political process and to be true and honest and to keep the politics in a straight and narrow, on a straight and narrow road, we have to get the population involved. And the population is not going to get involved unless they have a say. One of the easiest ways to do it is the process of referendum. And all that has to do in the Constitution, all you have to do is say the process of, rep of, of referendum is, will be part of the Constitution. You can have a referendum committee that will determine how the referendum is going to be conducted. The other thing I would like to strongly recommend is proportional representation. Again, going back to the 2007 figures, Okay, proportional representation, proportional representation has to be part of our governance system. You have this whole swath of people outside there who every single time they go into an election, they lose, they lose, they lose. What happens? They go home, the next time they stay in home, next time they are not going to go and vote. Okay, and that is where the executive had grown too strong because you do not have people who, who can really and truly exercise their civic right in voting. And then there are a number of other things that we, we should be looking at. The right to recall, I believe it was um, Rudnat Kapaldeo, who was teaching in England as the head of the then DLP, okay, and a, and a, and a, and a parliamentarian who had been given leave for, for nearly five years teaching in, in his teaching in England, and he's a parliamentarian in Trinidad. How can that, that cannot be right. That cannot be right. So there are a number of other things that I would like to, um, I would like to propose, but I am going to submit, okay, a written, I'm going to be doing a, a written submission, but please, referendum, proportional representation, right to recall. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cadiz. Uh, I, 
Yeah, we're guided, yes. Yes, sir. Yes, by all means. Go. Oh, sorry, Raul Bermudez, Twin City. Um, a couple decades ago, when we started getting scattering ATM machines all over the country, I wrote a short little paper. I suggested that we issue national ID cards with a magnetic strip. And I contacted the people at the Lynx company and asked them whether one could use their machines to do referenda where a government can say, do we buy another boat for Tobago or two planes? And you could stick in your little card and say yes or no. And you could have 10 different questions. And it's not binding, but it could have given a, the government a, a, an idea of where, where the people stand, what they feel about this, that, or the other. Yeah? Thank, thank you, Mr. Bermudez. And, and uh, colleagues and participants, perhaps what's being shared just by the simple contribution uh, from Mr. Bermudez is, and has the time come for technology to play a greater role in the society being able to have a say in all that is important for the society? Good point. Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, we've had Mr. Amar, we've had Mr. Kedis. Sir, good evening and welcome. Yes, and good evening, members of the panel, the moderator, city council staff, members of the media, and the audience. My name is Andre L. Ekers. Mark Twain wrote a book in 1897, Follows the Equator. In chapter 20, it said, by the goodness of God, we are blessed with three unspeakable truths. Freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, and the prudence not to practice either one of them. And that is the reason Trinidad and Tobago is topsy-turvy. I do not believe there is anything inherently wrong with the Constitution, save in the case it needs to be adjusted to their current culture of this society. I remember at one point in time we were proud people. We knew right was right and we knew wrong was wrong. However, in the recent past, right have become wrong and wrong have become right because of context, how well one could reason wrong to be right and right to be wrong, and of course how resourceful one is in this society to silence individuals who have information that says otherwise. As a result, we have persons in different arms of government and under the purview of the service commissions that are blatantly showing the agendas that is diametrically opposed to the interests of the citizens of this country. Some of these agendas are racial agendas, political agendas, geographic agendas, professional agendas, agendas that deal with sucking all the resources out of the country at the expense of others, including future generations. Also, to lose, I lose a little chain at all I apologize about that. I believe human behavior is fairly constant over time. Although we have many actors and actresses in Trinidad and Tobago. Warren Buffett once said, the chains of habit are too light to be felt until it's too heavy to be broken. It is that reason I believe we need a measure of human behavior. And I propose that in the new constitution, we should have an index that measures persons' personal and professional conduct. I believe with this index, it should be objective, universal, and applicable to all in this society. 
If those indexes are adopted in the new constitution, it will determine whether or not somebody is employed by the state, how far, how much, how much power, the, the extent of power they will be given by the state, their tenure, and whether or not they stay in their current position. Last year, the Express, the Newsday, the Guardian rep, um, reported that an attorney in Trinidad and Tobago provided forged documents and admitted to the court and he was fined $2,000 for forged documents. Yesterday, I contacted the registrar of the hall of um, the judiciary in Trinidad and Tobago, and I am told that that person still has a certificate to practice law in this country, and he's a notary public. That is somebody who deals with determining the authenticity of documents. What is baffling in this country is that this attorney has 45 years of service in this country, I do not have course closed, unfortunately. <laughs> unfortunately not. Our church closed and party closed. Right. So my question is, under the current arrangement in this country, what is preventing that person in the future from being the next member of parliament? What is preventing that person from being a member in the executive? What is preventing that person from being a judicial officer? What is preventing that person to be under the purview of the service commission? And of course, what is preventing that person to be seated at that table? No one here um, had nothing to do with the forged documents. So I know it have senior counsel, um, Sinanan. <laughs> and uh, Mrs. Jackie Sampson, you are not mentioned in, the, in that. So I declare my name, man. There are no court clues. <coughs> right. Lose my chain of thought again. Humbly apologize about that. I believe if this index is adopted in the new constitution, Everybody in Trinidad will be on the P's and Q's, and there will be order and equity in this system. So what's the takeaway here? In the year 1215, a group of barons surrounded King John and forced him to sign the Magna Carta. That set off the chain reaction for the different arms of government. Successive, successive versions of the Magna Carta have ensured that there is a separation of powers and we have an independent service commission. I do not believe that we should go about willy-nilly, adding and taking in a way elements in, in, the, in the current constitution. I do not believe that at all whatsoever because it could have dire consequences. In the book, The Richest Man That Ruled Babylon, it had a treasure chest and under that treasure chest it, it, it was inscribed. It is better a little caution than a great regret. At this moment, in this country, we are in purgatory. We are suffering, but this suffering is temporary. We are in a place between heaven and hell. What is required in this country is for us to put aside the differences we have among us. And 
force the person, um, individuals for the adoption of yes. this index. Please be informed, it is not only the politicians in this country that is creating obstacles for progress in this country. If we do not adopt this index, then we will be in the depths of hell in Satan clutches. And so help us, God. I hand back the meeting to the moderator, Mr. Wendell Constantine, and members of the panel. Thank you, for, uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to speak. Thank you. And thank you for your contribution. Members, we continue. And uh, the microphone is turned over to an honorable senator. Good evening. Good evening, Wendell. Good evening, everyone. Good evening to the head table, uh, to the chairman, senior, and all uh, the members present and not present. I don't have any profound opening quotation. I do have 15 points, and I have to get through them in seven minutes. But I just want to start by saying, I think, following what uh, Dr. Farrell indicated at the start, that I was actually expecting to have to stand in the back because I just came in on the eve of 6 o'clock because I, expect, I was expecting such a large turnout here uh, for obvious reasons because of the uh, sentiments expressed throughout the population over years and in many, many different sectors. But I think what we're seeing here is an apathy and a real sense of skepticism. And I think uh, many are suspicious about the timing of this exercise. It's not lost on the population and the election is due not too distant future, and people are wondering, well, yes, it's a good exercise uh, because the Constitution needs to be a living, breathing document, and the Parliament amends it in small measure on a weekly basis in both houses of Parliament, but this is, I guess, meant to gauge for significant changes in the Constitution as we saw in 76. So I think that is part of the reason for this level of apathy and lack of participation. I also believe that... Uh, this is, as any social scientist knows, this is a snapshot because these meetings are very, very small compared to the size of the population. And it will not, although it's a good exercise, it, it doesn't really give a sense in a large scale as to what the wider population thinks. So I think many of the, uh, 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 echo many of the sentiments uh, uh, expressed before. I'll, I'll start with the, and I'll go specifically to parts of the Constitution, the Representation of the People Act, which I think uh, is paramount at this time. One, campaign finance reform, because if you look at the Constitution, it's very sketchy now in terms of the implications of that part of the Constitution and the issues of alleged corruption and nepotism and cronyism, etc. I think that's very important. Uh, I think, and I've raised this in Parliament recently, digital and social media protection in elections, which we have not dealt with at all. And we've seen what's happened so, uh, apparently in Trinidad and Tobago, and what's happened in the US and the UK in terms of the digital impact. Uh, we have laws that uh, relate to the media practice in Trinidad and Tobago, where as a, at midnight on the eve of an election, one cannot continue advertising on, in the press and on electronic media, but campaigning continues on digital platforms, and our constitution has not addressed that. That's dangerous. The issue of disinformation and misinformation deliberately disseminated because information is the basis on which people are supposed to make what should be rational decisions about who governs them for the next term. And that is a big issue coming up that has not been tackled in our constitution. Private sector funding, uh, that may not be coming from within the party bowels and how we keep track of that and the impact of that on the election outcome. I work in the media, so I know of the huge spends on traditional media and now what is being spent on digital media and the impact of international players in our elections through digital platforms and how we're addressing that in elections. Uh, we've seen what happened in super, super PACs. Uh, earlier on, one of the, the speakers spoke to term limits, which I think is something we need to consider in this country. Uh, fixed election dates, which I'm a proponent of. I'm a, a strong supporter of that. The, responsibility, the constitutional responsibility of members of elected members of parliament and selected members of parliament, but also more so elect, elected members of parliament, because they're elected by persons who they campaign for, 
and whether or not they are living up to their expectations in, in the context of some people having extremely heavy cabinet responsibilities. There's been a conversation about whether that is the appropriate arrangement or whether some other arrangement needs to be, to be considered because sometimes one suffers more than the other. And uh, the much repeated proportional representation, which I think needs to be a serious consideration in Trinidad and Tobago, as opposed to first past the post, and electronic voting, that's part one. I am also a strong supporter of referendum, uh, but there are many options and many questions where this is concerned, which we need to give deep thought to. Is the referendum going to be embedded in the election process, as we see in the US? Or is it going to be a, 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 an arrangement outside the election process? If so, who triggers the, ele the referendum? How is it triggered? Who chooses the questions that are be to be asked? And how does that not become political in the end? And end up in an imbroglio, as we always do, as very often do in Trinidad and Tobago. How are we going to manage that? Is it that it's going to be the election, and the prime minister gives a question, and the opposition leader gives a question for balance, and so there's no... Uh, suspicion of, well, these particular referendum questions suits X as opposed to Y. Those are the issues we have to grapple with when we're talking referendum. And if it's constitutionally embedded in the election so that when you go into the booth, there are three questions awaiting you, and you take yes or no for each one, so there's a, a level of anonymity, and also the population gets a say on significant critical issues facing the population. Ref for example, referendum, if we want that if we want proportional representation. So that is a difficult prospect for any prime minister to, to uh, ignore, even if he or she thinks it doesn't suit their purposes, which we've seen in the past. Uh, I'm a very strong proponent also of having a mandatory national census every seven years. Policy decisions cannot be made without data. Dr. Farrell knows that very well, and I guess other people on the table. And very often, these, these national census exercises take too long, and we're working with old data. We don't know what population demographic shifts, so we don't know what we're dealing with in the population. Uh, so I think you know, one must consider that generations change every seven to nine years, depending on the jurisdiction that you're in. So I think the CSO needs to have a, a mandate in the Constitution that we need to have a national census every seven years or so, so we know what we're dealing with. Uh, I'll just uh, outline the headline for the other one because it's in advance in the parliament for many different reasons, Tobago House of Assembly and the THA Act and how we uh, give Tobago more autonomous power or authority. Uh, Education Act, Concordat, the relationship between uh, the state and denominational schools and education is one of my passions. So the Education Act states in Tangier that, you know, Everyone's supposed to get a quality education, but is everyone getting a quality education? And is the act as presently constructed facilitating that? And what are the recourse of parents or educators or, or, or learners in different categories in the country? So I think that needs to be a significant, because without a, an education act that is servicing the population and developing the human resource in a consistent, effective way, in line with labor market trends, in line with the needs of the society, and, and the strategies projected forward. We're kind of shooting in the dark. Uh, state board compositions, which I have a very strong view on, because state boards have become almost, I'm trying to be kind here, because I know we're being recorded. State boards have become a bastion of, I'm trying to be very kind and creative, of rewards. <laughs> Let me put it that way broadly where sometimes people on state boards end up who have no competence in the area. And I think state boards should have a composition. I understand the policies of the government in power or in authority needs to be, need to be championed. But I think in terms of transparency and accountability and oversight, my suggestion is the state board needs to have one opposition nominee and one nominee from the private sector who is a professional in the field. That's oversight. And the majority of the state board members being nominated by the government because I think state boards have become a runaway issue in Trinidad and Tobago, and this has not been addressed, and we just accept it. Uh, local government to be enshrined in the Constitution so that it cannot be just put off and put off and put off. It's not, to my knowledge, presently firmly enshrined in the Constitution. Uh, national security oversight. We have the, the recent SSA imbroglio, and you have to ask the question based on the utterances of the other Prime Minister, 
how so much happened to such a great extent without some sort of oversight mechanism or body being triggered. And so we come from behind now and investigating something that has significant national security implications. It clearly was a runaway horse. If it got to the point where the, the substantive head had to be sent in suspension and a, an audit being conducted of personnel, equipment, and processes, that there's, no, there's clearly some sort of office oversight deficiency, and, and it should not be exclusive to that agency, because if it happened in that agency, what other agencies of national security is it occurring in, or has it occurred in that we haven't identified yet? I think uh, the PCA Act can be amended to include uh, potentially all arms of agencies of national security give more resources, uh, including potential investigative powers that don't clash with police operations, so that there is more of an independent oversight body uh, looking at national security apparatus and agencies in the country. Uh, I think many people know my, my view strongly on disability law in the country, where protection for persons with disability in education, health, social services, infrastructure, access to transportation, and social and cultural activities. I think the, the issue of the CCJ versus the Privy Council can be an aspect that the referendum deals with in terms of how the population feels about it, because clearly there's a, a divide in terms of the political uh, elements in the country where the movement from this, the Privy Council to the CCJ is concerned, and the population can be involved in that decision with the correct information being disseminated and a rational discussion about it taking place, hopefully with politics, the political element minimized as much as possible. Uh, there's a situation in, in some provinces in Canada where the length of trial, criminal trials that is, is circumscribed by a particular time frame uh, following which the state has to prove why they shouldn't let this person go, because someone should not be on remand for 17 to 18 years. That is anathema to human rights and justice, and, and justice in any part of the world. But that happens in Trinidad and Tobago, and there's a perception, well, once you're charged, or you're in jail, you're guilty. And that's not the premise on which our justice system was established. Uh, so it, um, the issue of an evolution of the telecommunications authority, telecommunications authority and how it, how it governs or regulates media space. It still primarily deals with traditional media, electronic media, and it has not gone into the realm of regulating the digital space. And I think I have one more before my seven minutes is up. Um, digital media oversight and how we're protecting our children from Facebook and TikTok and all these things and the issue of AI and how and if TAT is the, is the, 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 should be the regulatory body for that, in terms of protection of a particular our children who are on social media all the time. Thank you. Thank you, Senator uh, Paul Richards, for your contribution. Members, uh, Mr. Andrew Akers wished to just uh, add a point to his previous statement. So we're making one leeway. You have the microphone for a few minutes. The way how this country operates is that it has an executive branch, a legislative branch, a judicial branch, and an independent service commission. And what is happening in this society is that people have lots of power, but they are not held accountable. And that is the reason why I said we need this index to measure professional and personal conduct. So it will be objective, universal, applicable to all. A general application of this index is that parliamentarians who fail to attend parliament, their index will be affected. Police officers who fail to attend court thereby causing criminals to get away scot-free. Their index will be affected. Doctors who create artificial conditions in the public health center, uh, public, um, the, the public hospitals, forcing individuals to go to 
private hospitals, their index will be affected. Persons whose responsibility it is. When private contractors pave the roads, that the roads have a particular standard, their index will be affected. And of course, the average man on the street, not the average, some persons on the street who tend to resort to violence and verbal abuse to police officers when they are, ex they are, they are they exercising their legal lawful duties, their index will be affected. So in this way, based on how you behave in your society, the, the, the society, your behavior will be tracked over time and whatever position you find yourself in the social ladder in this society is because of your behavior, no one else. That's it. Thank you for your contribution. Uh, we invite others who are present to please make your way to the microphones and we facilitate your, your input as well. So welcome and good evening to you. Good evening. Careful. Good evening all. Yes. All protocols observed. I am Ronald Gibbings. I live in the Karana area. I am taking a cue from uh, Senator Richards's uh, cue on state board governance, or let's just say in today, regulating of the media, digitally speaking. I have an article, I just want to use the headline and a couple of clips from it here. January 3rd, 2019, page 12 of the Newsday. And the headline says, How Jamaica Went Forward. I'd just like to look at uh, the e-government of Jamaica. The boss there wasn't happy in Jamaica about Jamaica's position in the UN's e-government development index, which has seen Jamaica drop from 112 to 118, while Trinidad and Tobago slipped from 70 to 78 in the latest rankings then. Uh, my present, not problem, but preoccupation is with a recent experience uh, that I've had, and that is, within one month, the TSTT has taken me over $500 without any service. I have been in the habit of doing a prepaid uh, monthly program, or bundle as they would call it. And uh, it so happened that uh, the data was out within three weeks. So conveniently on my way home from doing good citizenship work, which is weekly I go and give an RI session at a secondary school, I popped into the office and I said, listen, I took a, a one-month uh, plan from you, and uh, it's out, so let me just get some data. So I paid again. It was like the 21st of the month, so I paid again. And subsequently, I got no data. And I said, boy, <laughs> if you want to maintain, manage your mental health, just go buy another outlet. So I go buy another franchisee outlet. Same be mobile, of course. Uh, I paid again, I paid more. Because I said, well, okay, they kind of woke me into a belief that this is going to be different. I said, do you have the instructions for this device you are giving me? It's a device I'm taking for the first time. Some Wi-Fi device. So I said, you know, I don't have Wi-Fi at home. And I said, do you have it, the instructions in English? I said, yes. Everything is in the box. And say, so go down and sign and pay. So, so I go, I pay the money. They have me sign an electronic board. They don't show me a document before I sign so that I will understand what I'm signing to. And I don't know if it is this 
technicality that they use, caveat emptor, whereby you got to be aware of what you're doing, um, customer. They don't explain, they don't show you the document. So I take the document, I go home, I get in my hammock and I start reading, I say, but hey, if I had seen this before, I wouldn't sign it. And so what I'm saying is, so I've had no data. I am not like the customer who doesn't get water, but he can still turn the pipe on and hear the music or the, or the pressure coming out. <laughs> you can't turn the data on or off yourself. All you can do is pay and wait. And this is my problem. I cannot go to number 8 Downing Street for TSTT. I cannot hire a lawyer. Something has got to be done with people who are uh, state board, uh, state enterprise operators, and other uh, actors on the part of the state who are defrauding citizens. And citizens, and I'm saying this, I did not mention TAT, but I am telling you, I did go to TAT, and I had one call subsequent after visiting TAT twice. I had one call from TSTT Direct, and that was it. Today on my way here, I'm listening to the news while driving, and I'm hearing TSTT plans to spend $160 million to upgrade their system. I said, hey boy, you've contributed $500 to that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Givings, for your contribution and for your perspective. Uh, members, the microphone is yours. Uh, we're just on approaching, I believe it's 7.30. So to facilitate any and all who have to make a contribution, according to the schedule, we should bring our segment to a close by 8 p.m. So I would want to ensure that those who have to make a contribution are afforded a uh, similar time. Mr. Amari, you wish to contribute? A cheat. <laughs> I want the head table to remember it is not emails. You are posting to a website. They must be clear in their instructions to the population because one thing says send emails to. Yes. It is not correct. It is send your information to the website and emails to this other site. Right now, the information that is being purported yeah. is misleading. Maybe we'll have a thousand people sending the information, but they can't get on. The second thing is, I agree with Senator Richards because I think term office, although we say we are a small country, we look at Guyana, 800,000 people, and they have term office. We're talking about Term. We have plenty of people in this country with ability. But if they don't get opportunity because one man holds down the job too long, we'll never progress. And the final thing is, this country is ethnically divided. And in the Constitution, we have to find a way to deal with this word called race. You see, this word race purports African and Indian. And in truth and in fact, none of us are Africans or Indians. We are at best Trinbegonians. So the Constitution needs to look at everywhere where it says something that is race and make sure we identify that. And maybe we could start with the national anthem. <clears throat> because we have the two last verses where every creed and race finds an equal place and we just sing it twice. Maybe we should change it to where every citizen finds an equal place and move away from the race. Thank you, Mr. Amar. Yeah, yes, Senator? A question for the, the... I forgot to ask this question because one of the issues with people participating is we're not aware of your terms of reference and many times these committees are formed to come up with a, a, a work product and we don't know what is supposed to happen with that. I know you have a particular mandate, but the population, I think, will be very curious to find out if is. they 
document that comes out of your consultation is going to be made public. What is the process for it after that in terms of it being operationalized or realized? Thank you. Fair enough. If I could assist from the website, the mandate of the National Advisory Committee on Constitutional Reform, one, to formulate terms of reference for a national dialogue on constitutional reform. Two, to make recommendations to cabinet for the promoting and convening of a national constitutional conference and consultation in June 2024. Three, to incorporate within the terms of reference outline parameters of subject matter for national debate and for the engagement of the widest cross-section of persons and bodies representing the citizenry, including the diaspora, political parties, NGOs, commercial interests, religious interests, labor or trade union interests, educators, and students, with a view to promoting meaningful consultations debate and engagement in the offering and exchange of opinions and the making of recommendations for constitutional reform. And four, to initiate, consult widely, and guide the national debate towards the generation of a package of ideas and opinions which we will be distilled into a working document and which will become the working document for the Constitution Conference to be held in June 2024. Uh, this is available on the website as well. So uh, I, again, the point is taken to continue to communicate this information for the benefit of all citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. We have our next contributor. Good evening and welcome. Good evening. Good evening, host and members of the commission fellow citizens. My name is Rudolf Hanamji. I actually was not feeling too well this evening, but I was driving by here and wondering if I should stop in. And I saw over 60 persons waiting opposite KFC there for transportation at this hour. And it reminded me that I needed to come and share what I would like to with the commission this evening because some of my fellow citizens talked about the vulnerable community. And even though I'm from Aruka now, and I spent a lot of my childhood there, I was born in Diego Martin, and I lived for many years in Diego Martin, and a lot of my life was in Port of Spain. But my grandparents were actually, well, one, my grandfather on my mother's side was actually from Sangre Grande, and my grandmother was from Point Fortin. So, had I been able to leave earlier, I did intend to come to all three conversations because I'm very clear about my historical connection to my country and where my ancestry comes from. But that is why I wanted to start on that note of vulnerable and at-risk communities and for the commission to really give some pause and consideration because I'm glad Wendell reread the mandate so I don't have to because I wanted to focus on item number two in your mandate which references the upcoming conference. So for context, since I was 15 years old I have been in social advocacy. I run one of Trinidad's largest NGOs. I, am, I have a law degree but I'm not an attorney and I have several years of experience in national policy development. So full disclosure, I sat on your, pre well, I was part of the administrative team of, your, of the predecessor commission to yours. And I did write the prime minister as a citizen asking if I could support this committee's work when he announced it because I always thought this was something that was very important. Because too often in society, we, I'm gonna say we or I'll speak for myself, privileged persons like myself who sit in positions like these, in halls like these. We discuss these matters, but the persons who we as elites in society, as Plato would have said, are supposed to make space for others in society. Doesn't mean that we didn't come from certain backgrounds or we didn't have our own challenges, but we have become empowered in society and 
we are the ones that are truly failing the vulnerable and at-risk communities in this country because why for so long do we not have a Disabilities Act? Why for so long does the Equal Opportunities Act not protect all citizens? So I could stand here and say to you that I agree with the mandatory census. I agree with removing the savings law clause. I agree with aligning with international in conventions. Take educational equity, for example. I'm a proud graduate of Queen's Royal College, which is a known privileged institution. But we shouldn't have privileged institutions in Trinidad and Tobago. All educational institutions should be equitable, and there should be access for every boy and girl, no matter where they are from. Because I had a colleague in school, Trent Phillip, who had to travel from Manzanilla every morning to get to Queen's Royal College, and he sat next to me. And we all knew that Trent would not be able to deliver on either his schoolwork or his extracurricular activities the way some of us would, because he did not have the support mechanisms that we did, and he would have to use an old blue PTSD bus without air conditioning from four o'clock in the morning to get to Queen's Royal College. So how would he ever be on an equitable standing? And that is why I prefer groups that I belong to. We are going to submit recommendations about the clauses of the Constitution and gaps and ideas. But I really wanted to reinforce tonight that Wendell spoke about communications and, and Senator Richards uh, sort of catalyzed his answer about that. There is a misunderstanding in the society about the role of the commission. And there's going to be an expectation out there that you all will not meet. And that expectation is obvious that people think that you all are collecting all these ideas to present a constitution. And I know it's written on the website, but that is not effective communication. And that is all part of why the apathy and the, the, the I could talk about those problems. But when you are looking now to solve what you all have done, or however, whoever organized this, and you're looking at that conference, you have to to make a concerted effort as people who have been given responsibility to make space for the vulnerable and the at risk to have a say and in, and in a genuine and effective way. Because a person who is blind needs to be facilitated in a different way than somebody who has autism or Down syndrome. And even senior citizens have to be facilitated differently. So, you need to recalibrate and reset the expectations of what this commission is really about so that you don't disappoint us as the citizens. You must make space as elites in society and speak out more. I was very taken aback recently when a minister of government used the parliament to undermine a business icon of this country, somebody that I look up to as a mentor. And that is not how we should be treating with our citizens who use their power and privilege to speak out about issues in society because then nobody else wants to. They will not go and speak out. The legislation is not a panacea. As somebody who studied law, who has practiced in, in fields where law is applied, you cannot legislate for everything. So the Constitution really has to act as a, as a framework a, a document of pillars that gives an alignment, a north star, a guiding post for which all other laws thereafter must align with. And you can see it taking its course in the US example right now with the, the immunity clause of the Constitution and, and the presidential, uh, if states can allow uh, a president to be on a ballot. They actively engage daily on whether they should take a traditionalist approach to the interpretation of the Constitution or a living approach. Our new Constitution must state categorically for my generation and those coming after, how are we supposed to interpret this document? If it continues to be vague, we are, we, many of us are not going to have justice because we can't afford to go to the courts, as someone else said. And just to give an example, and I know this is going to cut close at, at home, but if you look at the constitution of the commission, it is not representative of the society and many of the people that we should be speaking for. And that was an oversight as far as I'm concerned. And 
anything that is being promoted by a government is automatically going to be distrusted by at least a quarter of the population. And therefore, when we are constituting commissions of this nature, they must have a heavy, heavy civil society presence so that it, it balances it off and gives it that level of credibility because you want to encourage the other sides to participate. So I could go on. I think I may have reached my seven minutes, Wendell. I tried to time myself. But I want to thank you for putting yourselves forward. But I thought it was important to share openly because I've been talking to a lot of people my age. I'm a millennial, by the way, and younger people. And these are some of the issues that they raise with me. So thank you very much. Thank you to Mr. Hanamji for his contribution. Uh, if I could only insert to assist uh, those who are gathered here and, and for the purpose of the coverage that the commission, uh, the Committee on Constitutional Reform has planned in this phase some 13 uh, public engagements. We are on engagement number three. There are 10 more to be facilitated. And I'll simply say from Mayaro to Tabakit, to Napuna to Arima, Princes Town to Chaguanas, Pinal de Beceparia to San Fernando. Uh, and the point is taken as it relates to availability for all, not just on a website, not just um, as an information portal. Mr. Bermudez, uh, fortunate that I do have your name beforehand. Welcome. Please go right ahead. I was 10 years old when my father, Jose Angel Bermudez, died 60 years ago. My mother is from Venezuela, and she had seven siblings, and she took us to live there. There was no money, so she placed each of her seven children with the godparents who were her siblings. <clears throat> While there, I was issued a Venezuelan passport. Eventually, I got a driving permit for cars and a driving permit for motorbikes. In Venezuela, when you're born, you're issued a number. And I got, got there when I was 10, but I was issued a number. And that number lives with me because you use it for every private and public engagement you do. We have a stupid method of arriving at a number for our ID cards, which is the, the date of birth plus a sequential number of how many people were born that day. Apparently, an effort is being made now that everybody should have an ID card to issue sequential numbers and so on. The idea I have is this, that we form a, a, a national assembly of 100 people, yes? And these people are going to be elected with the last two digits of a properly for formulated ID card, yes? And it will do away with this nonsense we see every time there's an election that you see the media puts up the map and then there's a red strip, a yellow strip and a, and a red strip below, yes? And every time, sometimes it might tweak a little bit, yes? If people were voting with the last two digits um, of the ID card, at home, coincidentally, there's none, none, none of my five children, my wife or I, have this, the same two digits in our existing cards and won't have it in the issue card, probably won't have it in the issue cards. What it means, though, that when, for one, parties would have to find 100 um, people to represent in each of the numbers. But they have difficulty finding 41, yes? Because out of the 41, probably seven have some redeeming value. Probably 15 could pass. But they have some that are a total absolute waste of time. When you have a, a, your constituency is scattered throughout the country because you don't even know where they are, yes? These numbers are, are all over the place. You have to address all of them. You have to serve all of them, yes, because you do not know who they are, yes. But what it also d does is because parties cannot find a hundred worthy candidates, 
um, independent parties can say, well, let me see what the, the size of it is. This idiot they put as 85 because they ran out of people to put. I'm going to offer myself as an 85 candidate for my independent party because he can't win. And you might find independent minded people, yes, being elected. I wrote something on that years ago and I can't, I can't find it because it goes much longer and so on. Um, I'll keep digging and I'll probably submit it before the 15th um, for you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bermudez. As we continue, gentlemen, sir, if you would just raise the microphone slightly so that it'll be easier for us to hear you. Thank you. Good evening and welcome. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Aaron Brown. Um, Aaron. From Digo Martin. Um, my contribution is very simple. I would like to see um, the members from the upper house, the, the upper house um, um, senators being voted in. I think that we have gone beyond the days of having PNM senators or UNC senators. Um, even, no, this is no dig to um, our independent senator because I think he's a fantastic gentleman who has done a, a lot of good work um, with the youths. But I feel that the office of the prime minister, who is the commander in chief, should not be involved in politics and have that power to be devolving, um, to be assigning by independent senators as much as she's a fantastic lady. So my contribution is very simple. I would like to see all our senators facing the, the, the ballots, just like the mayors, just like the councillors, just like the, the, the lower um, MPs. Thank you. And thank you. Members, I don't mean to uh, change the tone or tenor, but so far indicative, Mr. Amar, Mr. Cadiz, Mr. Akers, Mr. Richards, Mr. Hanumji, Mr. Gibbings, Mr. Bermudez, Mr. Brown. Perhaps there may be some member of the fairer sex present that may dare to share the wisdom of listening to others speak for the night that perhaps you may wish to make a contribution as well. There is an opportunity afforded. Would you accept the invitation? Yes, ma'am. Welcome. Uh, Rudy, if just assist with the microphone for her, please. I appreciate it. Thank you. Good evening and welcome. Good evening, everybody, members of the head table, moderator, members of the public. I am Zaida Rajnath from St. James. Before I say what I want to change in the Constitution, I want to pose a question. Which member, which CEO, successful CEO in the private sector would be successful if he had no authority to determine what staff he will have with organizations, what skill sets, how much he's going to pay them, if he can appoint them, if he can discipline them, if he can transfer them, if he can, can terminate them. Would that CEO, says Jervis Warner, Master Group of Companies, would that CEO have been as successful as he was without these authorities? So which brings me to the public service, which is my passion, right? We have CEOs in the public service which are permanent secretaries, who manage billions in funds. We have the PS Ministry of Health here. His budget is 6.4 billion. He cannot determine, in the health sector, dealing with life and death. To manage a minister, help a minister, deliver on his mandate, when he cannot determine what staffing he's going to have, right? what skill set, how we could change the skill set in terms of changes in the environment. We had COVID. You need a quick change in your skill set, right? When you can't determine how he's going to pay these people to attract and retain the staff to support, right? Kind of promote, kind of transfer, kind of discipline. Discipline is a thorny issue in the public service. Winston, I'm sorry, this is not an attack on you as chairman of the Public Service Commission. 
is what I'm saying, that we need to change in the Constitution, which establishes a public service commission with certain mandates, appoint, promote, transfer, so on so. But the, the Public Service Commission does not have the authority to determine which jobs in the public service, how much they will pay for those jobs, right? The structure of the public service, that lies personal department, it lies PMC, the Ministry of Public Administration, so you have a fragmentation, right? You have a public service commission that's managing the entire public service, 30, 40,000 people with all these things. You have ministries waiting for CPO to determine salaries, which in some cases are not competitive. So we can't attract and retain, right? The right skill sets we want. We have no authority I say we because I'm the former PS to Prime Minister and Harry Public Service. I was also Deputy Chairman of the Public Service Commission. So I see it from both sides. So I'm saying, unless we want the public, and I'm not dealing with efficiency in the public service, et cetera. I'm dealing with the structure, right? If we want to see some improvement in the public service, we need to deal with the issue of a public service commission in the Constitution. Thank you so much. Ms. Rajnath, first, thank you for stepping forward to the microphone. Secondly, thank you for your service. And thirdly, thank you for your contribution. Much appreciated. Members, we'll stop at this time. I think that we've facilitated those who were eager to make their contributions present. Mr. Kedis, by all means, yes? Final thing. Um, the Constitution is really and truly a contract with the people and, the, 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 and their country. And I think when we, write, when we rewrite the Constitution, we need to take notice that uh, not everybody is a legal luminary, all right? And if I'm gonna have a contract that is for me as to how I, I should be living in, in, in my country, how I should, what kind of citizen should I be, I should be able to understand it in simple layman's terms. Now, I know you can't go to court maybe with a simplified contract, but there should be some, it, it should be part and parcel of the deal, of you have the legal jargon for a constitution, and this is exactly what it means in layman's terms. Um, very simple suggestion. Thank you, Mr. Cadiz. If, if, I, if I was to simply take Mr. Amar's point as he's back on his legs, he used the words bite size. Sorry. Uh, microphone. Sorry. Thank you. I heard you address all the areas, and we always make this mistake in this country. We left out Tobago. Uh, so you know, Tobago is there. Because uh, I, did, I didn't hear you say I, it. I didn't, but Tobago is also in, the, in the, the group of 13. I believe on two occasions, not simply one either. Yeah, but thank you for the observation. I really didn't want to become um, a listing of all the, the, the meetings, so I just uh, picked a few, and my apologies if it might have been misunderstood. So thank you again, Mr. Amar, for making the point. Well, members, we've come to what can be considered a healthy engagement, uh, small but impactful. I'll defer to the chairman now, who has the responsibility to uh, close the meeting and deliver his, his closing and vote of thanks. Chairman? Thank you very much, Wendell. Uh, earlier on, I said I was a little disappointed in the size of the, of the audience, and I spoke about quality and quantity. Um, let me congratulate all the contributors, because I think we had very, very good quality contributions made uh, this afternoon. Uh, it's my hope that as we go forward, more and more people will come out and contribute, because that is what we want. Without the input of the citizens of this country, our, our work would be of no effect. Let me thank the mayor and uh, councillors of the City Corporation for affording us the use of the Murchison Browns uh, Auditorium. I want to thank the media, especially 
for their coverage and their continued support. Lastly, again, I want to appeal to, through the media, to the, the wider public to encourage the citizens to come forth at these town hall meetings and also to, if you can't, make your contributions via the, uh, the website. And uh, Mr. Amar has pointed out that we need a little work to do on the website and thank you for the, uh, your input on that regard. We will make sure that the, web, the errors in the website uh, are, are corrected. So thank you very, very much. And um, thank you, Zaida, for contributing, uh, appealing to, uh, uh, on Wendell's appeal that uh, you contributed. I know when I saw you here this evening, I know that you would want to contribute. And uh, I thank Wendell for urging you to contribute. And on that note, we want to have more women contribute. So far, as Robert says, we're only having men contribute, but the society is not only composed of men, it's composed of women, and perhaps more women than men. So we, we need the women to come forward and contribute. So thank you again very much for attending our town hall. Thank you very much for your contribution. Have a safe journey home. Good night. Our thanks to the chairman. Members, you will have the opportunity, by certainly if you wish to engage with the, with the members of the committee. And may I also acknowledge the presence of some young citizens in the audience. Gentlemen, thanks for spending your Friday evening away from an iPad, cell phone, and a screen to share a little bit on the future of what you will inherit in a few years from now. Thanks for being with us. Be safe, everyone.